And there's so many things out there. To connect it with um, what Connie said at the beginning about you know, the colonization of, of you know, this country and whatnot, OK? And again, without, it would say this humbly to you know, a fire dancer here before you know, we were here, or they were here, et cetera. But the, when the land was plotted out, I'm talking about real property here, OK? They start marching westward and make sections and quarter sections and all this stuff and territories and states. And then every state has, a, once it's a state, has counties. And then every little piece of real property, I'm talking about the dirt we're walking on right here, is measured and marked. And who owns that property is recorded in Pickham County Clerk and Recorder's Office right down the street here in, in this county. That's at every county in the state of Colorado. What happened with securitization schemes is there were, I don't know how many trillions and trillions of dollars of promises that were made based on mortgages. Okay, the foundation, you know, a mortgage-backed security is a security backed by a mortgage. There was a lot of fraud that's in other litigation that I'm not involved in, you know, like related to, you know, targeting minority populations, tons of stuff. You get, it's, a, it's hard to keep up with what's going on, all the stuff that's coming out of this. But my point is that the promises that were made in the securitization of mortgages and in the ensuring of whether those mortgages would be paid or whether they would not and which ones are you going to bet against as an investor. And investors have rights here too. You know, everyone has, has rights here. But it's like um, the a value of those promises that were made in the securitization industry to each other exceeded the gross domestic product of the world, according to various reports I've seen, like somewhere between 12 and 20 fold. Okay, it was totally illusory promises made on the backs of mortgages to secure real property. Okay, that's all crashed. Everybody is suing everybody over all of that. Now what there is is a mad rush to come in and take the property and get as much as they can out of that. Okay, now, what I'm focused on now, what my legislative proposals are focused on is, wait a minute, real property is not one of your promises among your banks. If you want to foreclose on real property under our real property you know, laws, you have to prove that you have a right to do that, that you are the person with the right to do it, the real party in interest, which means that you're the one who's entitled to be paid on this mortgage, or if you're acting as an agent for the person that's entitled to be paid, prove your agency relationship. And that can be done under various provisions of the Uniform Commercial Code, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but also under the terms of the pooling and servicing agreements that the securities industry created. They are required to follow certain procedures to even get each one of those mortgages into the trust that owns those mortgages, right? If they don't do that under New York law, it's a void transaction. They don't own the note, okay? They don't have a right to foreclose based on that security. Now, in the materials I have here, there's a reference, and this is, it's become public knowledge. It's been pled in cases, you know, my cases from day one and other cases around the country, but it's becoming public knowledge now in the Congressional Oversight Panel, which was appointed to do the TARP supervise the administration of the TARP funds, reported in November that this is a major problem. You know, these notes didn't make it into the, into the trust. So therefore, there are going to be some problems with foreclosures, right? So what I'm focused on here is changing the law in Colorado. And it's not new law in Colorado. It's getting back to basic old laws that's been around forever. In Massachusetts, where a major ruling was just made in January, Ibanez or Ibanez v. Um, uh, um, I can't remember, Wells Fargo or U.S. Bank, whatever. The Massachusetts uh, Supreme Judicial Court says whatever promises you guys made, I'm paraphrasing here, whatever promises you guys made in your securitization schemes, you know real property law in this state. You can't just come in and get clear title to property when you haven't proven that you had a right to do it. It's put um, real property in Massachusetts really at issue. Title insurers are not insuring securitized loans anymore in some jurisdictions. They're looking at it real closely, so it's a major problem. In Colorado, we have the same situation where what I would like to do is just get back to basics. They can prove that they have a right to foreclose. Right now, someone can foreclose based on a certification. 
case. I certify that I have a right to foreclose. Therefore, I can foreclose under Rule 120. And the sad fact is they can if no one opposes it. They can just say they have a right to do it, and they can foreclose, and they don't have to show all the uh, endorsements, the assignments, if they have the right to do it. It's a non-binding uh, order. You know, it's like uh, it's not an appealable judgment. It's not a final judgment. But in order to challenge it, a homeowner has to file a separate lawsuit. When you get into a separate lawsuit, the judge, a lot of the judges, there are intelligent judges in this in the state and district courts. A lot of them, they know the law. You know, they know what the old law is. And uh, some of them, um, totally in my experience, are right there. Some are just beginning to know it. So you're going to get different results in different courts depending upon the judge's particular um, understanding of what the law is and what the rights are. And of course, judges are human beings. You know, it's one of, one of the greatest strengths and greatest weaknesses of our government. You know, it's three branches of uh, government. You know, we have an independent judiciary to redress your grievances, but they're only human. So, you know, you're gonna, every time you go to court, somebody wins, somebody loses. So, you know, no lawyer can guarantee a result. You know, you're gonna get different results in every proceeding. So what we need to do, in my opinion, is get to the Supreme Court as soon as possible, as many cases as are necessary to focus on the issues that will require entities that come into foreclose to show that they have a right to do so before the judge signs off on the Rule 120 order, and to do that up front without requiring a homeowner to go through litigation to prove it, you know, because it gets real expensive. Lawyers can't do that for free, or at least so my colleagues tell me. I've been doing too much of it, but I got a job recently, so now I have other work to do, but I can you know, keep these cases that I have going. Also, the legislature, I think, could take some steps. Legislature actually, I think, you know, at one extreme should impose a moratorium on foreclosures until they change the law and figure out what to do here. And the reason for that is not just because people are being foreclosed on, but because the way foreclosures are done, it's affecting the fundamental integrity of real property records in the state of Colorado. Every real property record in the clerk and recorder's office in Pitkin County is affected by what's going on right now in foreclosures. Because foreclosures are being done in a Rule 120 proceeding by entities who don't, maybe. So if they do, they have a right to foreclose, go ahead, foreclose. If they don't, then uh, the title to the, of the person who buys that is in jeopardy. They may not get title insurance. So everybody involved in real property, people in foreclosure, people buying a house out of foreclosure, title insurance companies, everybody is affected by the way foreclosures are done in Colorado right now because the proof is so limited. So that's really the big picture on this thing, in my view. We need to change the legislation and um, need to get some cases up to the Supreme Court to kind of nail this, nail this down. Is that a good place to stop? That's a great place. Thank, thank you, Stephen. As you can see, it's extremely complicated. Stephen there is speaking as best he can as an attorney to the layman. And yet the terminology is such that we really have to understand what on earth, what on earth is a pooling and servicing agreement? Who would know if you weren't in that particular realm? So it's extremely complicated. So we can't begin to, and, and I think you can see that to unravel this at this level is, is very, very difficult to, to, uh, to, uh, to approach this through the legal, through the justice system is kind of the only path we have, and yet it's incredibly difficult, and we're up against an enormous, um, it's even a prejudice in that how on earth could the banks be so wrong? You know, the banks have always been these honored members of society. Your local bank manager in your, in your town was, you know, was someone you went to when you were in trouble. You know, now you see them, you run, maybe. <laughs>